Okay, guys, this is going to be a little introduction to the concept of torque, which is the, probably the next chapter in your book. Torque is a really cool thing. It, up until now, we've had an object like a, uh, a, a block, and it's been on the ground, and we've been pulling it with a force, and then there's been friction. And what did we do? We lied and said friction was acting right at that center of mass. And then we lied again, and we said the normal force was acting from the center of mass, and then we had gravity, of course, going down, acting from the center of mass. So in other words, we just pretended that it was just uh, this, this, this whole thing was acting like there was just one particle, just one particle, okay? That was a lie. So now we're not lying anymore. Torque is having something to do with force times a distance away from this point. So this point that we called the center of mass, we used to lie and say it was like that, but let's be more practical. If you had a box like this, and it was on the floor, and you pushed it right here, it would probably just go straight. Agree? But what if instead of pushing it from here, you pushed it from here, and you pushed really, really hard from there? Now what do you think it'll do? I bet you it might tilt over. So this thing is not only going to be moving, but it's going to be rotating. Get it? It might just pivot right here, and the whole damn thing might just kind of like fall over, and it's rotating sideways like that. Get it? So torque is this concept having to do that. So let's get some equations down. The equation is R cross F. Now, R cross F is a way to multiply two vectors together, and the answer is a vector. Okay. In another chapter, we learned all about work, or you will learn about work, and work is equal to force dot displacement. And that dot means you're multiplying two vectors together, and you're getting a scalar as an answer. So depending on whether we got to that yet, depends on the, the order of the chapters or not. That's called the dot product because the answer comes out to be a scalar, so it's called the scalar product. This thing is called the cross product. You multiply this by this, you get a vector. You get an answer that has direction. So a directional thing times a directional thing. Now, how do you find the magnitude of it? How do you actually know the answer to torque? The magnitude of the torque is the magnitude of this moment arm, I'll tell you that in a minute, times the magnitude of the force times the sine of the angle between the two. Okay? Translation is this. When you do torque, the only thing that counts is the perpendicular component. So let's say you had a meter stick and you put a little screw in the wall, and you had the meter stick able to rotate on the wall like that, okay? That meter stick, if you just let go, would rotate this way because of gravity. That little force acts like all the mass of the entire meter stick is acting as if all the mass is hiding at the center of mass. You should write that down about five times. If you have a uniform object, there is a spot called the center of mass, and you can pretend all the mass is at that point. You gotta take calculus to really prove it, so if you're not in a calculus-based class, all you gotta do is believe me. All the mass of the whole meter stick acts like it's all concentrated in that one spot. Pretend the whole meter stick's hollow and massless, except for one spot, and all the mass of the meter stick is at that spot. So it's as if it's like pivoted here, and then the mass of the meter stick. Now look what's going on here. If this meter stick is one meter, because we called it a meter stick, let's call it one meter, then if I pivot right there, that might be at the 0.5 meter point. In other words, half. So, what's the torque? Let's say that thing weighed, um, I don't know, three newtons. Let's say three newtons was mg, the force of gravity. Okay, so if three newtons is the force of gravity, what's the torque? What's causing it to rotate? Well, the torque is equal to R cross F. Now, in this particular case, what is the angle between R, here's the vector R, and the force F? What's the angle between them? The answer is 90 degrees. Sweet. It's always great when it's 90 degrees because now it's R times F times the sine of 90. And why do I think it's so great? Because the sine of 90 is 1. 
So in other words, you get the maximum torque when they're at right angles to each other. It's a very important concept to remember. When there's 90 degrees between the moment arm and the force, you get the maximum torque. Any other angle is going to be less than that. And zero degrees, there's no torque at all. Okay? I'll show you that in a minute. Okay? So torque in this particular case would be 0.5 times 3 or 1.5 meter newtons. Okay? They didn't name it anything, so you can name it after yourself if you want. Meter newtons, and that's the magnitude of the torque. That's that easy for some of these questions. Okay? But I want to show you this concept of the angle in between and see if that helps. So let's go over to the door and see if I can help you understand that a little bit better. So swivel that seat around, Nick, see what you got. Okay? All right. So when you open a door, you're really doing a really great little demonstration of torque. All right? Because here's the moment arm. From the hinges to where I apply the force is the definition of a moment arm. Fancy word for moment is it, it's the old way of saying the word torque. So if you see in a book or a lab the word moment, it means torque. Okay? So from here, the pivot point, to where the force is applied, that's R. And then when I pull, that's F. Ooh, look, I opened the door. Okay? But when I say I opened the door, what did I do? I rotated this thing like that. If I want this door to shut, then it's R cross F. And I go that way. I shut the door. Get it? So it's R times F. Now, what if, and I, and I was looking for some suction cups or something that, that people use to pull dents out of cars. But if you put a suction cup right here, would it be harder or easier to open this door? If I didn't use it from the handle, but I used it from the middle, if I had a handle here, it would be more difficult, wouldn't it? Right? Because it's R is half as much. Half the R, I gotta have twice the force to have the same torque. What if I had the handle right here? Can you imagine how hard it would be to open the door? I mean, imagine that. Because R is so small, I would need like, you know, a lot of force to get the same door open that was easy over here. Get it? So when R is big, force doesn't have to be big. But when R is really, really small, the force has to be crazy. So here's a great example, okay? It's sitting right here waiting for you, all right? Bicep is attached right about here, and it's about two centimeters away from the pivot point, your elbow. So here's the elbow. That's the pivot point. Now, the bicep is connected right there. How far away from the pivot point is the bicep connected? <laughs> Not much at all. So because the bicep is connected so close, when I curl, let's say I was curling a 50-pound weight, yeah, I wish I could. But in the old days, I swear I could, honest. So if I pulled up with a 50-pound weight or just held it like that, think about how much force has to be in the bicep. If this is 10 times the distance where the weight is than where the uh, bicep is pivoted, if this distance is 10 times this distance, then this bicep to lift up 50 has to have a force in it of 500. Is that wild? Okay? So you may think, well, that's just a bad design or bad evolution or whatever you believe in. But think about it. If the bicep was connected here and it's able to do 500 pounds, then, whoa, that would have been a better way to do it, right? Hook the bicep here and you could lift up something 500 pounds. <laughs> yeah, but not. Think about it. If you lift up 500 pounds, this is how much you could lift it. That much. Your freedom of motion wouldn't be this. Your freedom of motion would be this. You could only move it that much, right? And maybe you could lift 500 pounds, but I bet you it would snap your ulna and radius trying to do that because you're torquing these two guys. So actually, this is a really nice thing to have. Put the bicep really, really close. Yeah, your muscle has to do 10 times more force than you could lift, but look at the freedom of motion we got for doing it. So you got these torque objects all over your body. Start checking out that you, you have some great examples of some really amazing torque. That's why legs are stronger than arms, because the R is bigger. You know, and the muscle, the quads can do a lot. I can, I can squat about 400 pounds with my legs, but could you imagine me trying to do that with my arms? It's just a different you know, R and a different capabilities for the tricep and the bicep. So hopefully that understood. Let's do one more before I go. 
If I pull here, what's the angle between R and F? 90 degrees, agree? This gives you the maximum. What if I open the door and I pulled like this, so now it's R times F, and it's like 135. Not that good. 135 sucks. What about 180? Nothing. Nothing. What about zero? Here's R, here's F. Zero. <laughs> I'm like pulling like crazy, I'm not rotating. So there's zero torque, maximum torque. Get it? So it's the angle that matters. All right, so let's come on back over here and see if we can work with that concept, okay? If torque is like that, we should be able to come up with some really cool examples. Like here's the classic example. If you took a meter stick like this, okay? And let's say it's a uniform meter stick. So that means right there, all the mass at the center of mass, it's concentrated right there at the center of mass. I don't want to write down CM because that scares me. C of M. So you don't think it's centimeters or something crazy, all right? So that is where all the force due to gravity is acting like it's pivoting right there. Got that? Okay. So if we wanted to play teeter-totter, where would we put the fulcrum? Where would we put the little pivot point? Well, I think we would put it right here. So if we made a little stand, this thing would balance right there. Agree? All right. Now, what if you had some fun and you made this thing so that it's, um, I mean, let me do this. Hold on. Go away. Yeah. What if I put a weight over here at the 10 centimeter mark. This is zero, that's 10 centimeters. And I stuck a weight here, okay? So this thing was um, three newtons, okay? And this thing is one newton, and I got it stuck right there. Now, where would I put the fulcrum in order to make this thing balance? Well, believe it or not, it's all got to do with torque. You'd have to put the fulcrum somewhere over here in order to balance this thing. So probably maybe right here I would have to put the book. So where is it? Where, where is this distance? Where is from one end to here, what's R? I don't know, all right? But we could figure it out. You see, all the mass of the meter stick acts like it's right there. Isn't that kind of cool? So we can call this X, right? And this is R, so the whole distance is 50, right? So it would be a really tough question because this would be, uh, what's this distance right here? We call it some other distance. So we'd have a lot of unknowns that we would have to figure out in order to figure out where that would be placed in order to balance. Okay? Let's try it anyway, see how we do. So, why don't we then pick this point as a pivot point? So when you do torque problems, step number one, pick a pivot point. Anywhere. Wait a minute, what do you mean anywhere? I gotta pick it there, right? Because that's where it's really pivoting. No, this is the cool part. You could pick it anywhere and it still works. Let me explain. If this is balanced, What's the net force if this is absolutely balanced? And the answer is zero. It's not accelerating up, down, or sideways. So there's no net force if this is balanced. Now here's the second condition you never knew before. It's called static equilibrium. We learned it in a previous chapter and we thought no net force, static equilibrium. It's not moving and there's no net force. Dynamic equilibrium means you're moving, but there's no net force. Remember this? Like a car on cruise control was dynamic or kinetic equilibrium. Equilibrium means no net force. Or if it's not moving, static equilibrium, like a mass on an on a inclined plane, mg sine theta down, friction up, nobody's winning. No net force. But there's another condition you didn't know before this chapter. Not only does no net force has to, no net force, the sum of the forces have to add up to zero. That means the weight plus the weight must equal the normal force. There is no net force. Okay? No net force. If there was, 
this thing was going this way, or going that way, or moving that way, or moving this way. No acceleration, no net force. The next condition that you never knew before is the sum of the torques must be equal to zero. Get it? So there's two conditions of static equilibrium. No net forces, no net torques. If there's a net force, it's going to translate and accelerate linearly. If there's a net torque, it's going to angularly accelerate. Angularly accelerate. It's going to start spinning. It's going to start spinning faster and faster and faster. Get it? So angular acceleration is the thing uh, that you probably read in the, in the chapter. It's actually torque is equal to I, the moment of inertia, times the angular acceleration. Just like the sum of the forces causes the mass to accelerate in a straight line, the sum of the torques cause the mass distribution to spin, to angularly accelerate, to start moving, to start accelerating. Okay? So you need both these conditions in order to, to be stationary. It ain't moving, it's not. I'll give you a good example. Here's a steering wheel pivoted into the wall. Let's put a little nail in the middle of the steering wheel so that it's on the wall. Okay? Now, get rid of the, wheel. Get rid of the, the thing. This is an outer space. So there's nothing around it. So if I pull like this, and I pull like this, 10 newtons down, 10 newtons up, and I'm in outer space, and there's no pivot, nothing, what would happen to this thing? Would it move? No. What's the net force? 10 this way, 10 that way, zero net force. Hey, no net force. All right? No net force means this thing won't move. It'll stay in the same spot in space. But is there no net torque? Oh, wait a minute. This would make it rotate clockwise, R times F clockwise. And this one is R times F clockwise. Two clockwises means this thing's going to rotate clockwise. That there is a net torque. So this thing is not in static equilibrium. How about this one? What if you take the wheel and you pull this way with 10 newtons? And you pull this way with 10 newtons. 10 newtons and 10 newtons? Is there a net torque? No, this one wants it to go clockwise. This one wants it to go counterclockwise. They're equal and opposite. No net torque. One rotates clockwise. The other one wants it to rotate counterclockwise. No net torque. But there's a net force of 20. So this whole wheel is going to not spin, but go that way. This one ain't going anywhere, but it's spinning. Pure rotation, pure translation, neither of these are in static equilibrium. Okay? You get that? I hope that helped. Now, let's go back to our example. What is the net force on this thing? Zero. It's not moving. What's the net torque on this thing? Zero. It's not rotating. So we got both conditions met. Therefore, this is in static equilibrium. Now, this is the weird thing. You might have to pause this video five times, say it over again, write it down in your notes right now. It doesn't matter where the pivot point is if nobody's winning. So even though that looks like the pivot point, I could pick the reference point to be here. I could put the reference point to be here. I could pick the reference point to be anywhere. And it still gives me the answer because the sum of the forces are still going to add up to zero, and the sum of the torques are still going to add up to zero, no matter where I pick as a reference point to do my torque. This will make a lot more sense once we actually try and go into this. Okay? So, I am going to pick a pivot point that you would not probably have picked. If you pick right here, look how many unknowns I have. I have this unknown, we'll call it Y, I have this unknown, we'll call this X. Okay? I don't know how far away this is from the pivot point, and I don't know how far away the center of mass of the meter stick is from the pivot point. I got a lot of unknowns. Okay? So it's kind of a bummer. So I'm going to pick a pivot point you probably wouldn't have picked. Right here. The end. I can do that? Yeah. Nobody's winning anyway. So pick it on the end. And watch what I do. The sum of the torques all have to add up to zero, right? So I'm going to sum them all up from my little blue pivot. It's not really pivoting there. It's just my reference point to use as 
think is it doesn't matter where you pick, you pick any spot, any spot that's going to work. But watch what I do. Step one, you know, pick a pivot point. So there it is right there. Step two, find all the torques from that pivot point. So here's what you got to do next. Step two, pick a positive rotation. Do you want clockwise to be positive? Is clockwise positive? If it is, then guess what? Counterclockwise is negative. A lot of people pick the opposite. A lot of people say counterclockwise, make that positive because in the uh, math class, you started from zero and you went this way to get to 90 degrees, 180. So a lot of people are more comfortable with counterclockwise being positive. It does not matter as long as you're consistent for this question. A different question, you might change your mind, but for this question, pick one of these. It'll work no matter what. So I am going to pick this one. Okay, so clockwise positive. So here it goes. I want you to imagine no other forces here except this dude, this one Newton guy. See it? How far away is he from the point I picked? I pick that point. How far away is he from that point? What's the moment arm? And the answer is uh, 10 centimeters. Let's use centimeters just to make life easy, okay? So 10 centimeters times one Newton. I'm kind of breaking some rules here because uh, Newtons don't really go with centimeters, but it's all gonna work out in the end, so don't worry about it, okay? Is that positive or negative? Positive or negative? Well, I decided to use this reference. So positive, clockwise, which direction would this thing spin if I really had a nail on the wall and it was just that dude? Positive. Okay, so positive 10 times 1. What's the next one? Here we go. This distance, I don't know what that distance is, but it's R. So plus or minus, let's think about that. Is it plus or minus this? So everybody, stare at this. There's R times F. Oh, if there was no other forces here causing rotation, and it was just this R times this F, would this spin clockwise or counterclockwise? And the answer is clockwise. No, counterclockwise. See, I'm getting myself mixed up. So R times F is going to make this thing rotate counterclockwise. Digital watches are killing this generation. You gotta look at a real clock once in a while to know that it's rotating that way. So rotating it that way means that it's minus, because I decided minus was counterclockwise, R times normal force. What's the normal force? One Newton is down, three Newtons is down, mg is three Newtons, and this other little hanging weight that we might be putting here is one newton, so four newtons. Four newtons must be the normal force because there's no other forces except one, three, and normal. And normal must be equal to four, otherwise there would be a net force and it would be rising up in the air or falling down, so no net force. So that's minus. One more. This distance times mg. So what is this distance? Well, if it was a uniform meter stick, what is that distance on a meter stick? Isn't that a half a meter? Isn't it right in the exact center? You do a torque lab, you'll find out that it's not exactly in the center. If you have a half meter stick, you'd expect it to be at 25 centimeters. It ends up being at 24.8. So it's not a perfect meter stick. This meter stick, I remember doing a lab, and it was all the way up to 49.3. When somebody was to chew the end off the other side to ruin that. But it wasn't at 50, it was at 49.3. So, plus or minus? Half a meter times that, plus or minus? I think it's plus. Why? Clockwise. So, plus uh, 50 centimeters times 3 newtons. Okay? And that is all the three forces. Let's try it. This one plus this one plus that one have to add up to zero. Isn't that sweet? Now look at 
What's the only unknown I have? The distance away. So because I picked the pivot point on the end, I got rid of one of the unknowns. Sweet, huh? And that ends up being just finding out what centimeter mark that thing is, is stuck to. So let's just kind of really quickly do that. I got 10 uh, plus 150, so that's 160 centimeters, newtons, weird units. My apologies. Move it over to the other side. This becomes positive R times 4 newtons. So 160 divided by 4, R equals, see how the newtons cancel, and I get centimeters, which is okay. I got the centimeters as my answer. So 160 divided by 4 is, last time I checked, 40 centimeter mark. So the pivot point from the end is 40, 40 centimeters. Okay? So that should help you like crazy with any kind of labs or homework problems that you're doing with torques because you can pick a pivot point anywhere. It's really great. Let me give you one more really classic example here. Um, you ever see like old window washer people? Window washers have like a plank. So let's see this is a 10 meter plank. It's like a huge long plank. And a cable is attached up there and another cable is attached here. And this is uh, tension two and this is tension one. These are the two cables, okay? If nobody's on this thing, and this thing has a uniform density, that means what? That the center of mass of the meter stick is smack dab in the middle at the five meter point. And let's say this thing has a mass of, um, let's make it uh, easy, and just say it's uh, a plank of 50 kilograms, okay? If you multiply that by 9.8, you get 490. Let's use 10 instead of 9.8. Why do I get away with that? Because then I can, uh, if I use 10 instead of 9.8, it makes life a lot easier than the thing. So multiply that by 10 meters per second squared, and I end up with 500 newtons of force down. If this weighs 500, what's the tension in these cables? Think about it for a minute. I'm going to pause the video. Think about this. What's T1 and T2 if this is the only thing going on here? And we can prove it with our technique that we just learned. All right? You're back because you paused it. 250 and 250. Were you right? I mean, think about it. They got to even it out. They got to they gotta separate it out. But now, believe it or not, you can prove it mathematically that you were right. Isn't that amazing that you can prove that you were right now? Let's try it. Okay? Sum of the torques equals zero. Okay? The sum of the forces equals zero. Therefore, T1 plus T2 minus Mg must equal zero. See, the net forces cause the mass to accelerate. It's not accelerating. So that means T1 plus T2 must be equal to 500 newtons. Now, does that prove that T1 equals T2? No. It just brings, if you add them together, they got to equal 500. You with me? Okay, so let's go over here to the sum of the torques. Let's try this. All right, check this out. Here is moment arm one from here to here. If I pick this point as my pivot point, that's R1, and over here is R2. Now, if that's R1 and that's R2, then the pivot point is that spot right there. Here we go. This is what we're going to do. Uh, T1 times R1. R1, T1. Okay? Is that going to be clockwise or counterclockwise? This is the pivot point, and that dude is pulling up from that point. Is that rotating it this way? Yes. So we want to make that positive, clockwise positive, okay, then it's positive. But this one is then torquing it counterclockwise. So that's negative. So minus R2T2 equals zero. The only way this would be true, R1T1 equals R2T2. And therefore, if R1 equals R2, because you pivoted it at the center of mass, 
The R is canceled, and you just proved that T1 equals T2, and they add up to 500. So that means T1 plus T2 is the same as T1 times 2, which is 2, T2, 1. And 500 divided by 2 is T1. So T1 is 250. Isn't that wild? All right, want to see something even more wild? What if... What if you picked this spot as the pivot point? When I say pivot point, I mean like a reference point. Doesn't matter where you pick it. Let's pick the end. Why? Wait a minute. What's the torque of T1 if you pick that spot? Wait a minute, there's no R. So it's T1 times 0. So 0 times T1. Okay? And then from here, what's this? 5 clockwise plus 5 meters times 500 newtons. And then this one is 10. Minus, minus 10, why minus? Counterclockwise, from here. You got, got a picture, it's from here. 10 times T2. And when I'm all done, that equals zero. Look how beautiful this is. I just got rid of one of the tensions. So one of the unknowns is gone. Move this over to the other side, and I got 2,500 equals, move it over to the other side, positive 10 times T2. T2 equals 2. 1,500 divided by 10, or 250. I got it in one step, people. 250. And then 250 for one of them, the other one's got to be 250. I can pick anywhere I want. Is that cool? All right. So if that's true, then what if I throw a little fun in there? What if uh, Nick, the uh, famous um, window washer, is standing right here? Okay? And Nick, Nick weighs uh, 800 newtons, and we're going to use 10 instead of 9.8. He weighs 800 newtons, and where's he standing? He's standing at the uh, two meter mark. How does that change things? Is T1 still equal to T2? Now wait a minute now, that dude is kind of making T1 greater because he's over on this side. You get it? What's got to be a true statement? T1 is up, T2 is up, and there's two weights down. 500 newtons down, 800 newtons down, 1300 all together. You get it? So T1 plus T2 must be equal to 1300. How'd I get that? Because it's T1 plus T2 minus mg minus m of nick times g, okay? And you add those all together, and it's moving over to the other side. The total weight is 500 plus another 800, 1300. So that means T1 plus T2 equals 1300. Where do you want to pick a pivot point? Oh yeah, you can pick it right there. If you do it right there, yeah. You're gonna have two unknowns, T1 and T2. But just for fun, why don't we pick the pivot point on the end? If you pick the pivot point on one end, you're going to get rid of one of the tensions. I love it. So let's do that. Honestly, I would love for you on your own to pick the reference point to be right there. It would be great practice to do that. All right? But then I want you to also try it there. It would be really good. Which one should I do? Should I do the hard one? Should I do the easy one? Well, I'll leave the easy one to you. Let's do the hard one. All right? So I just decided that we are going to make the pivot point to be right there at the center of mass. Now, what's the only force that's not going to count toward torque? This one. Because we picked it right there. Okay? So let's try it. The sum of all the torques. And the pivot point is not on the end right now. The pivot point is there. I'll leave it to you to do it on one end and prove to me that it's the exact same thing. So here we go. Here's the pivot point. All right, pick a force. Uh, T2. How far away? Five. Five times T2. Counterclockwise, minus five times T2. Okay? 
All right, from this pivot point, plus um, zero times mg, 500. Well, that was stupid to even write down. It's a good habit, okay? Next one. How far away is it? He's at two meters, then this is what? Three, right? Three meters. Three times mg. Clockwise or counterclockwise? Ooh, counterclockwise. So minus again, minus three times 800. Okay? And then the last one, how far away? Five, T1 clockwise. So plus T1 times five. And that all adds up to being zero. See how hard this is? I got two unknowns, T1 and T2. Okay? So uh, let's see if I can do the numbers quick enough where I'm not going to make you pause the video. All right, so if I move uh, these guys over, that's um, five times T1 equals five T2 plus uh, 2,400. Did I do that right? Check the numbers. Okay, and then T1 equals Divide everybody by five. Oh, crap. Did I pick the wrong numbers or what? That would be T2 plus 2,400 divided by five. How many times is five going to 2,400? It's stressful, man. It's uh, 40, uh, four, five goes into 24 times with uh, 400 left over. So is it 48? Somebody check my work. I don't know. Okay? So did I do that right? You can't answer it, eh? <laughs> so T1 equals this mess, if I did it right. 5 goes into 24 four times with 4 left over, 400, um, 480, 480, all right? Um, check my work, see if that doesn't make sense. So 40 and turn it into 20. I don't know. <laughs> I'm too tired to figure that out. All right, so um, uh, whatever that is, if I did it right, T1 equals T2 plus 480, that's got to go right there. Every time I see a T1, i got to put all that in there, and you'll find that I have one unknown, T2. The T1 goes away when I stick that in there, okay? And then you get your answer, okay? So try it out and see if I got it right. <laughs> but five goes into 2,400, really, 480 times, then I did that right. So 480 times five, let's see if that works. That's zero and 40, uh, actually that's uh, 40 and 24. Is that right? Carry the four, 24. Yeah, I think I'm right. Okay, so... Um, that would give you the answer, because now you end up with uh, T2 plus T2 plus 480 equals 1300, and then T1, T2 times 2, because T2 plus T2 is 2T2, equals 1300 minus um, 480 is um, um, uh, 820. I hope I did that right. 820. T2 is half of 820, which is 410 newtons, okay? If T2 is 410, then T1 is 410 plus 480, which would be um, 890. Now let's try to see if that works. T1 equals 890 newtons. T2 is equal to 410. If you add those together, do you get 1,300? Yes. Okay? So, it sounds like it works out. Does it make sense that T1 is 410 and T2, I'm sorry, T1 is 890 and T1, T2 is only 410? Why is this one so much bigger? More than twice as much. Because Nick is pulling down on this side more than that side because of that. OK? 
Okay? Now, if I'm right, and I should be able to erase this whole thing, I should be able to erase this whole thing and do it over again with the pivot points somewhere else. So now I'm going to do it the easy way. What I consider the easy way is to pick a more creative pivot point. How about if I pick the pivot point on the end? Do this with me. It would be awesome right now if you stopped the video and you did the whole thing without watching it. Here's the difference between spectating and doing. Right now, stop the video. You know what to do. You're going to start at this point. This is 2 meters away, 5 meters away, 10 meters away, 0 meters away. So T1 is not going to be in your equation because there's no torque. Stop the video and try it. All right, hopefully you're back. I can tell. I can see from the look on your face, you didn't stop the video. You're watching me get good at physics. You ain't going to get good at physics watching me get good at physics. You can't play for the NFL just because you watch a lot of football. Get out there and kick and throw and stuff. Now stop the video. All right, now you're back. You lied. All right, some of you are still watching me get good at this, and that's okay. I'll get an A. You won't. All right, so here it goes. Here we go. It's zero times T1. Sweet. From that point, there is no torque. Um, plus, this guy's pulling down clockwise, plus, because it's clockwise, 800 times 2. Next one, clockwise, plus 500 times 5. And then minus, why minus? Counterclockwise. From that point, 10 minus, sorry, minus 10 times T2. And that all equals zero when you're done. All right, guys, we only have one unknown now. This is going to look real familiar. There's 2,500 plus another 1,600. 2,500 plus 1,600 equals 10 T2. So 2,500 plus 1,600 is 4,100. 4,100 equals 10 T2. 410 newtons equals T2. Sweet. Same thing I got over there. Let's see how fast I got it. And if one is 410, the other one's got to be 890 because they have to add up to 1,500. See how easy it is? All right? So practice a few of those. You should watch this video a couple of times before you try that lab, because the lab's a little complicated and a little confusing if you don't do one of these or five of these problems on your own. So do some mastering physics, do a couple of this, watch this video a couple of times, work out the paper. If you didn't do it before, if you didn't pause the video, go through this thing and see if you can do it without my help. Okay?